certainly changed in 41 years, otherwise it's the same flight deck as you would have seen, so a real piece of aviation iconic history. Uh, seating wise, well, she's not too dissimilar to another aircraft of her era, like the you know, VC-10 707, yeah, yeah. classic 747 jumbos. Very similar to this in terms of seating and layout, so captain and left-hand seat traditionally. First officer, flight engineer, that almost certainly there would be a navigator, almost other aircraft just mentioned, but not on uh, Concorde. She had all the modern inertial navigation systems, so no need for a navigator, so that became a spare seat on Concorde. And then the, the actual instrumentation itself is duplicated both sides. I'll do this side so you can all see. There's the airspeed indicator, uh, Mach meter for when you've gone through the speed of sound, compasses down there for directional information, and those two there, and the same on that side are altimeters, radar and a pressure altimeter. Those are your engine instruments, engines one, two, three, and four. So they're being monitored by the pilots at all times to make sure the engines are doing what they should do, and nothing more or less. And if you didn't know before, I'm sure you did, that Concorde used to lower in raise nose for takeoff and landing. Yeah, that was that, wasn't it? Yeah, reason, uh, that's that, that's the yeah. leader there. But the reason being is, uh, is is visibility for the pilots. The way she's designed, she's designed to fly at high speed. Does that exceptionally well, but everything else she doesn't do very well at all, to be perfectly honest. At low speed, she has to fly at a very high nose degree attitude. Up. So at that attitude, these uh, these guys can't see out the window, basically. So all they can see is a long pointy nose and a lot of sky, which is no good. So uh, that's when they use this lever here to bring the visor and then the nose itself out of the way so they can see for takeoff and landing. Mm. But to say she was designed in the 60s and, and phys physically hands-on built in the 70s, you know, she was way ahead of her time. Mm -hmm. So advanced for her time. Uh, the, you know, the technology that she introduced um, was the forerunner to today's aircraft, such as uh, auto throttle, auto land, fly-by-wire. She was the first ever fly-by-wire aircraft in the world, commercial aircraft. So, um, basically, computerisation, that, that means, and apart from backup systems, because you need backup systems if it all goes peak yeah. tongue, but other than that, normal day to day routine operations, she's got no, um, uh, nothing physically connecting front to back. So throttles, for example, on takeoff, they go fully forward. It's a computer input to the engines, the engines power up to full power. So what's called dry power at the moment, mm -hmm. not enough to get the aircraft in the air yet, you want that extra 20% push. Uh, it's going to cost you 100% more fuel consumption, uh, but it's only on for a short period of time, and that's the four piano keys there. Uh, and when they're engaged and full throttle in that configuration, yeah, she is now a powerful beast. Take your feet off, your, off the brakes and she lurches forward like a scalding cat. Mm -hmm. And uh, anywhere between 19 and 30 seconds later, depending on her weight, she'll be at you know, 250 miles an hour, rotation speed. Yeah. And away she goes. Um, if she does reach her maximum cruising altitude, that's 60,000 feet, 11 miles above the earth. Not only is that high, but it's pretty cold as well up there. Mm. About minus 55, minus 60 degrees Celsius. Mm. Uh, but if anything, Concord wishes it was cooler because you know she's uh, trying to stay as cool as possible on the outside. Well, she doesn't stay cool, she gets hot, basically. It's the, it's the compressed air, the, the molecules sitting in the aircraft at such a rate of knots. Compressed air uh, agitates against the airframe, uh, it gets hot. She's got a limiting factor on the nose there of plus 127 degrees Celsius. That's how hot she can get. And at those kind of temperatures where you know metal expands and Concorde wasn't exempt that philosophy so she, she, she used to grow in flight and I'm sure you've heard that story. Uh, we caught about 20 centimetres, 8 inches in, a, in supersonic cruise. Mm. You can't see or sense it in the cabin, it's not as if you're having a meal and a meal starts moving away or anything like that. <laughs> uh, but on the flight deck, uh, there's a blue label there, cabin secure for takeoff, it's behind your right elbow now. The battery starts there to work you. on this, there you go. There's the flight engineer's panel, and there is a little gap between the two panels there, fingertip size gap, that's all. Yeah. Uh, but in supersonic crews, that's where the gap did manifest itself, so much so the flight engineer could put his whole hand in there. <laughs> and then the very last Concorde flight, full stop, lock, stock and barrel, took place on the 26th of November 2003. It was a British show. Was that one to filter? Yeah, yeah, Arthur Fox dropped flying from London Heathrow to filter. Now, obviously, it's just across the way, but uh, for one last time, she did a supersonic flight. She nipped down the Bay of Biscay first for a supersonic flight, and that gap started to appear, and the guy sat there, the flight engineer, thought, I'm not going to miss my chance here, and he took his cap, and he put the cap in the gap. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and he put it there and he left it because he knew full well obviously as the aircraft slowed down and cooled down the gap would then contract again yeah. and you can see the size of the gap there it's yeah. hardly there so that'll trap yeah. the gap forever and that's what he yeah. did and the cap is there today at Bristol Fields and Aircraft at Bristol Fields and Aerodrome on that aircraft and the engineer himself what a very busy man as you can see all the uh, the dials and switches there 90% of that would be used in flight the other 10% in an emergency and he's the guy transferring fuel around the aircraft in flight to, to, you know, to trim the aircraft in yeah. flight. He's looking at uh, passenger comfort uh, as well as other things, you know, passenger in terms of cabin temperature, pressurisation, altitude. Um, so yeah, busy, busy, busy man. Yeah. You wonder actually if they built a, um, another supersonic aircraft whether a lot of this would be kind of... Um, It'd be glass, wouldn't it? Right? Glass from top, yeah. 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 They could have done that with Concorde if they wanted yeah. to, but thank God they didn't. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because there's no need to. You know, those aircraft out there today, you know, the, well, basically, let's call it Boeing and 
Airbus, they're the two big boys, Boeing yeah. and Airbus. Yeah. They're always in competition with each other. They're always coming up with new technology to try and sell their jets. Well, yeah. Concorde had no competition. Mm -hmm. There was nothing uh, to sell, so yeah. she didn't have to change. That's why she still looks like this 41 years on. Had they you know, converted this to a glass screen cockpit, that wouldn't have been Concorde. This is Concorde. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it just wouldn't have been right. So fortunately, they've kept her just the way she was, apart from, like I say, TCAS. Yeah. yeah. Any questions, guys? Do you want to swap seats, take photographs? Yeah. And I'll let you get back.